Hello and welcome to episode 57 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this week I have been gardening. Gardening through a veil of sweat as the sun burst forth and the deadlines rolled onwards. It has been a, a good week, an exciting week, a full mid-season week of planting and propagating and a little bit of pottering. On this episode I am talking about the creation of a totemic woodland garden, about the passive-aggressive watering boasts of nameless gardeners, and about bluebells and birch trees, just to leave things on an evocative and poetic note. But enough of this introduction, let's get straight on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week in which I added to my growing collection of wrinkles by getting my first proper sunburn of the year. This sunburn is mainly focused on the middle arm region, which makes it a quintessential farmer's tan. And farmer's tans tend to strike me at about this time of year where the body is pale and underexposed, and I'm caught in that awkward in-between wardrobe moment. In the summer, I tend to wear long sleeve shirts with collars that you can roll up and roll down and, and flap around, uh, breezy little things. And in the winter, I wear woolen jumpers over the top of a t-shirt, because wearing a heavy woolen jumper over a, over a shirt is scrunchy and, and wrinkly and it doesn't work so well. But this time of year leaves me stripping off layers and, and hopping around like a, a de-shelled snail. And this sun acts as a reminder that we are entering watering season once more. Entering watering season in our garden. Some gardens and some gardeners never need to water. They will tell you with, with great joy. They, they tell you it in, in conversation. Just slip it in there. Well, we don't really need to water here. And what this is, is a gigantic boast. It means that they have looked after their soil so well. It is so rich and deep and damp and fecund that they would never need to apply additional liquid to it. When the earth is eventually swallowed, by the red giant sun in five billion years from now, their soil will be the last scrap remaining on the surface of a blistered earth. That's what they're telling you. Or they're telling you that they choose their plants so well for each part of the garden that they have no need for water. Because darling, don't you know, once you've chosen just to grow thistles, you don't need to water anymore. Anyway, we can't get away with that because our garden's full of all sorts of ridiculous stuff that I and others have put in all sorts of places that they really don't belong. And it's also quite new in the big plantings and so things are still getting established. And we have thick composty soil, but we don't have 80 years of dedicated cultivation. We haven't had gardeners living with the wheelbarrow in their hand and dying and rotting into the soil. We have three years worth of, of really heavy mulching, so, so we're not there yet. So the main things that I'm watering at the moment are the tree ferns. And tree ferns will always, always need watering. They love water. And I'm watering those every single day with a big wand hose. It's a really nice start to the day. You go up there and, and stagger about with the wand, and because you need to wait a good minute or two to really soak the crown of each one, there's time to do some thinking, to listen to some headlines on the news, to, to muster your thoughts generally. 
the fronds and the longest ones have, have advanced by about a foot. They're, they're well on their way to unfurling. I can't actually remember the gardening I did on Monday. You'd think after such a long break to compose myself, I would muster my thoughts slightly better for the return podcast. But I, I'm sure I did something involving weeding. I wandered about the place and took out the egregious weeds. Took out the ones that would stop a visitor in their track and say, hang on a bit, I'm not a pro, but even I can recognise that that should not be growing there. Sometimes that's rather vital. It's like when you tidy your teenage bedroom by just throwing the, the most incriminating of evidence into a wardrobe. And then you think, well, I'll get away with that for, for another week. So that's what I did on Monday. On Tuesday, I was out in the meadow, which is starting to bubble with this yellow rattle, the parasitic plant. I don't know what we are thinking when we broadcast the seed, because the whole thing seems to be yellow rattle at the moment. The poor grass doesn't stand a chance. We wanted to introduce a little botanical vampire to them, and instead we have opened the gates of hell, and all of these blood-sucking little, little fiendish plants are out there, sticking their roots into the grass roots. So they're, they're thrusting up, just beginning to, to bud, just beginning to show yellow through the, the mound of the flower bud. So that's going to look quite interesting in, in a week or two, when they're all in flower. I've noticed the impact on the grass already. It is far lower in, in many places, which is, which is the idea. I don't want to knock all the grass out in one go then, but because then we open the ground to all sorts of wonderful new pioneer species, such as brambles and docks. I'm sure that won't be too much of a problem, but something to keep an eye on. In that area of the garden, we've been doing a little bit of planting on the edge of a big lawn, We'd put a little stand of silver birch and these silver birch come out on a sort of spit of brackeny bluebell wood and I think what we're going to do is manage the bracken by knocking off the, the violin fiddleheads when they come out of the ground and just encourage the bluebells because in mid-spring there is no sight better than dark English bluebells under under light birch stems it's got the air of an impressionist painting that that bruised shadow blue with the the bold upright strokes above it it's quite a magnificent effect whenever you see it and we're going to go for a little bit of magnificence as is our want so we're doing a lot of watering over there carting buckets and and hose pipes well the hose pipes reach about halfway and then buckets and wheelbarrows full of water got to keep them happy got to got to get their roots down there nicely in the first year that was that was quite uh, an exciting thing to go back and check on those and then we did the old chelsea chop on some of the six hills giant the chelsea chop sounds like a bit of a pub fighting move teeth everywhere that sort of thing but it's not, it's a well-recognised horticultural technique where you take back a particularly vivacious, herbaceous plant by about half to stop it turning into a sprawling giant. You know how people with gigantism, the medical condition, end up being pretty sick because they just get too big for their, their joints and for, for gravity and for the, the spinning of the world and they end up flopping over and dying early well this sort of happens to plants and they, they get rained on and then end up turning into a into a puddle rather than a, a mound rather than a shape and then a peter are a prime candidate for that particularly a big one like six cells giant so what we did was just sheared the whole thing back by half and then rooted amongst those those clippings to propagate from so we took a couple of hundred soft herbaceous cuttings, uh, trim, trimmed the cuttings back so that the bottom of them was just below a leaf node and those leaf nodes are where all of those hormones are packed in, all of those plant stem cells that can turn into things and we took off the existing things which were nascent little flower buds and nipped them off and so hopefully now they've been dipped in rooting hormone and put in a very very gritty compost 
the the poor confused little cuttings will, will think well I've got to do something with the energy that remains in me I know I will thrust out some some roots into this soil and then next year when we're going to do some very big beds completely edged with nepeta to keep the deer away then there will be hundreds of free plants for us to to use it is the magic of gardening it's a, it is a magical thing and um, we, get, we get blasé about it but it's fantastically magic having said which they might all rot I put them in little pots with with uh, sandwich bags essentially over the top so that they are in their own humid little terrariums, uh, cut price terrariums, and so hopefully they will take. But we don't know. They might. They might rot. They might droop. They might wilt. They might get some sort of horrible disease. They might get ignored while I go on holiday later in the year. Who knows? That was Tuesday. On Wednesday, I was digging a path, digging a path for this magical woodland walk. This woodland walk is a whole new garden that I am building and it's actually working out really well. It's one of these instances where having certain constraints adds to creativity. So this was an area that was filled with rickety old outbuildings. I think I talked about them in one of the podcasts. I knocked them down with a digger and now the area's only one use is to store some very, very long, about 12 foot long very thick oak posts that can be, if needed, run up to the terrace to support a, a gazebo slash awning for, for some sort of showery soiree. And we've decided that these posts are going to be stored upright like great woodland totem poles. So we have set some, some metal post bases into the ground, dug them in a, a metre and a half or so, and stood these vast oak trunks upright. And then I'm putting a path in between them, a path with, with a pebble stones on it. And then running away from the path up banks are going to be all sorts of, of woodland plants, of geraniums, uh, the really woodlandy geraniums, the dose and that kind of stuff. And the first job really was to, to get this path started. So I got the digger, carved out a channel and then shoveled a ton or so of, of MOT scalpings. The stuff that people build railways on top of and, and that, that lies deep beneath the motorway that you, you skim across. It's a, it's a very rough granite type stone. Whacked that down with a whacker plate so that it gives a nice level solid surface stuck down some membranes or something then covered the whole lot with these scottish river pebbles flat round little things that you can walk on sounds like you're you're careering down brighton beach when you go for a walk through this little woodland now but but it looks quite magical and then after that my my glamorous assistant actually must take the credit for this shoveled about 18 tons of horse manure homemade compost and a bit of new topsoil in there to to create these these lush banks i think the key i've decided now is using our own compost in these things it's like a, a transfer of, of bacteria and microorganisms and and little creatures into the area straight away so we've got lots and lots of new compost in there and the whole thing is is starting to look quite distinguished and designed in a way, it has a, a character lent to it by these these vast uprights. It looks like something you might see in a Thomas Stuart Smith garden, were he less interested in in beech columns and more interested in lumps of wood. Land art, that's what I should call it. I've been creating some land art on Wednesday. On Thursday, I created very little. I read about other people's creations in the British Library. I was there reading about Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, he of Central Park fame. So stay tuned for more Olmsted. I think I'll be reading about him for the next few Thursdays, as there is a there's an Olmsted essay fast approaching on the master's course. I'm impressed, I have to say, with Olmsted. I, I like the chap. Anyway, back to gardening. On Friday, we worked on the woodland garden again and started placing plants. It's quite hard when you start placing them. You, you start by thinking about the big things. 
we've got three acer dissectums and a cornus cusa to provide a sort of middle story layer beneath the, the thick shade of the beach and so getting them sorted out along with some very large ferns and and the banks of the the area itself to just try and get something that stops the eye without shocking it that doesn't let you look straight through the garden but doesn't block any sight lines and give a give a hedge effect so mucked around with those for a bit and then started scattering little woodland herbaceous stuff around the around the base and um it took a lot longer than i thought and then time starts to run away and it's friday anyway so there's all sorts of friday rush jobs friday i like to get the garden looking as as neat and all spit polished and beautiful for the weekend i want to leave there at at four o'clock on friday afternoon knowing that anyone at any time could step out of any door shed door house door helicopter door gin and tonic in hand sit in the garden and sigh ah here i am paradise and you can't do that if you if you've left forks lying around and there's half a pile of weeding left somewhere else and that thing is obviously dying and needs to be chopped down and, and taken away somewhere. So I was trying to do this alongside all of the other the other woodland jobs and and fairly distracted by by many things. But I think we we got it sorted. Mowing the lawns, putting some stripes on there always helps. Getting the edging right. It's tricky, isn't it? It's like a haircut, particularly a boy's haircut. You want that neatness, but you don't want a, a newly shaved conscript look. We want some sort of of rough romance around the edges, but at the same time that the suggestion that this is run with an iron trowel. I had it in my calendar that that, that Friday would be the day that the woodland garden was finished. And I think there's at least another four days work. So so things are slipping, spiralling out of control. Um, and next week is going to going to end up being horrendously horrendously busy but, but that's what we like we like late evenings uh sweat and and deadlines you can no doubt hear all about it on next week's garden log for now let's see if there are any recommendations this week My recommendation this week is a novel. It is Reservoir 13 by John McGregor. And I'm a sucker for this kind of book because it's sort of bleak observation bucolia. Stuff about the year moving on while people make a life in the landscape. And I I particularly love the style. It's written in this omniscient narrator style where where a cast of characters is flitted between constantly within within one paragraph you might have 15 or 16 characters mentioned just a sentence about each as they go about their their lives within this landscape and i don't think that there have been many classic novels featuring gardening but this this is certainly one i don't know if, if mcgregor has an allotment but he gets the the grumpy allotment people absolutely perfectly. I'm going to read you a paragraph from three quarters of the way through the book. And from it, I think you'll get a sense of the man as a writer and of what allotments are like. From his window, if he slid far enough down the pillow, Jackson could see the flag on the tower of the church and know the strength and direction of the wind. And in March, the first westerly of the year had the flag standing out straight. It had him thinking of the flags on the moor when they were looking for the girl. The allotments committee got the insurance money for the burnt-out sheds, and there were rumblings when the replacements went up. Everyone will be burning out their sheds if that's what you get in return, Clive said. 
Susanna Wright took on the allotment plot next to Clive's. It had only been vacant a few months and was in good order. She walked round it with him and started talking about a shed, new paths, a lawn area with a table and chairs. There was a greenhouse, but some of the panes were missing, and she talked about replacing those. He nodded, but he was making a face. You look like you have a suggestion, she said. Clive pulled some shreds of plastic feed bag from the brambles by the greenhouse and began coiling them around his fist. Not really a suggestion, he said, more of an observation. Susanna waited. We get a lot of new folk taking on plots, he said. They like to do a lot of tidying up. They like to make the place look nice, make themselves comfortable. Takes a lot of work. Get so they forget to do the planting. Susanna nodded. There were some pieces of broken glass in the soil beneath the brambles, and she crouched down to pick them up. And that was my mistake last time. It's a question of priorities, he said. You get your plants in at the right time. Get the mulch down, do the weeding, do the watering. That's work enough. You do all that, you'll enjoy being here. A plot full of healthy plants, crops coming off, flowers out. That's the best little place in the world. You'll not be worrying about benches or lawns or tidy paths, water features, wind chimes. Clive? He looked at her. I see you putting a bleeding wind chime up here. I'll be straight over to take it down, he said. She laughed, but he wasn't joking. That's noted, she said. I appreciate it. I don't want to meddle, he said. No, please do, meddle away. He looked at her and handed over the coil of shredded plastic. Bins are in the car park he said. As he turned to go, she heard him mutter something more about wind chimes. The clocks went forward, and the evenings opened out. The bracken shoots sprang slowly from the hills and unwound towards the sky. The penned pheasants on the estate started to lay, and the eggs were taken to the hatchery to be washed and sorted. Sue Cooper was made redundant from her job at the BBC, with a much smaller payment than she'd been offered the year before. It's just very good writing about allotments and allotment committee members. Obviously most of the book is not about allotments. It's about the hunt for a girl gone missing on the moors. But um, to come for the horror and stay for the horticulture is probably as good a way of getting people into gardening as any. And the book's worth reading for, for other lines. A few pages after that passage, there's this wonderful what a bit where he describes the, the gentle cushioning of the broad beans pod as one of nature's senseless excesses, which is, which is true. When you have a shuck day, a broad bean, why is it so perfectly, luxuriantly, opulently cushioned in there? Anyway, that's a book well worth reading if you get any time between the, the onrush of summer. Thank you very much for listening today. Sorry again for the absence. Hopefully I'll be back next week to tell you how the Woodland Project got on. In the meantime, enjoy the Chelsea Flower Show. I believe that is on now. And make sure you get out into your own garden or into other people's gardens. Uh, fences, uh, they're not much of a barrier, are they? And just enjoy yourself in nature. I will be out there working on my farmer's tan and collecting some more gardening anecdotes for next week. Thank you very, very much for listening. And goodbye.